CPR, go ahead and turn it on and let us know when it's on. I will as soon as he lets me know. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. The timer is tiny. Okay, so left, <laughs> left off last week. Oh, she's so we, last week we left off with... Uh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> With some stuff. I'm happy to see you. <laughs> no. Okay. We're talking about the uh, wedding customs, as what I managed to find from the Talmud and other various rabbinic sources. The Jewish Encyclopedia and the Encyclopedia Judaica. Everything that I'm reading to you is public domain. I'm not reading any copyrighted material as far as that goes. But, and of course, they're basing all this on their, on their rabbinic stuff, and they do give the source material. Anyway, so we were talking about some various different customs, and we went through one or two. We're up to a new one. It says that on the Sabbath morning, the friends of the bride, among whom there must be at least five grown persons clad in the bride's garments. In other words, it has to be women wearing the ugly bridal dresses. <laughs> has to be at least five of them. Five wise, five unwise. Remember that uh, story? You find that in the Christian Bible, and you find that story in the Talmud, both. Uh, there had to be at least five. So you couldn't say there were three wise and six unwise, right? Because then you wouldn't have a party. Anyway, so that's where that comes from. And they say that they're all dressed up, and they go from house to house, leaving invitations to the feast and receiving wherever they may stop sugar, coffee, apples or eggs almost sounds like halloween doesn't it if the groom is rich he is even obliged to have silk wedding garments made for the members of his household if you saw that show fiddler on the roof do you remember on the sabbath the uh two men came in and they had black well, I just say silk. I don't know why it just jumped out of my head. They had black silk outfits on, but if you also notice during the wedding ceremony, a whole bunch of people had it on. It was because even though that guy was not what we would think of as rich, compared to everybody else, he was rich. So he was expected to do that. The groom, it says, is preceded by young men and the bride by girls with drums and with hand, well, hand, it says singular, hand clapping and tatar songs. That's what it says. While the hair of the weeping bride is being combed, the girls light the lamps. Then the bride, kneeling, receives her mother's blessing. Somewhere they say she's weeping because she's sad that she's leaving her parents' house. I doubt that ever happened. Anyway, the girl, the girls following with lights, generally white candles. Of course, this is dark ages. White candles ornamented with blossoms. The candles were. Goes on. He is led, I guess we're back to the groom. He is led with music to the court of the synagogue where under the chuppah, the rabbi with two pupils awaits the pair. The music ceasing, the groom goes under the chuppah. The bride is led a few times around the chuppah. The bridesmaids and the others carry lights the ritual is that of the Sephardim, that's the Spanish Jews. The rabbi sits during the ceremony, and both he and, oh, the rabbi, 
both he and the groom hold a glass of wine during the blessing, drinking after each of them. So they have a drink after every blessing. <laughs> I don't know how you could have a legal wedding by the time they got to it. If he wouldn't know who he was married or what he was, you know. After the ceremony, guns and rockets are discharged. The bride, closely veiled by her attendants, is put on a ha horse, rather, starts to put on a house, she's put on a horse, which a relative of the groom leads while another holds a mirror before her face, and with shouting and music, the couple are led home showered on the way with rice arriving or arrived it says at the house of the bride the girls dance and as soon as she crosses the seal the doorposts are smeared with honey while a light burns over the door at the same time the young men again discharge pistols the musicians are then paid and the wedding procession is ended so <laughs> this is this is the redneck jews <laughs> i love this wedding ceremony late in the evening after the guests have departed the groom is led to the bride after a time the young men call him out discharging guns the bride's mother must prepare for them a cock and a hen or all her chickens will be stolen and killed. The bride herself remains for 12 days behind a curtain, guarded by girls who demand pay from the groom. The Grusia, no, in Grusia, which is modern day Georgia, so that's Russia, the groom and bride are led in festive train from their homes to the synagogue where they take their places beside the bima which is where you read the scriptures after a blessing upon the czar the groom covers himself and the bride with the tali while the hakam oh gosh i'm having such a hard time reading this the text is just really small Oh, so he pronounces, yeah, that's what it is, pronounces the first blessing. The groom holds a ring and an earthen vessel containing wine. Then handling the ring or handing the ring to the bride, he breaks the vessel covered by a cloth and ends of which both hold the bride and groom circle around the bima kiss the curtain of the ark of the law and leave the synagogue
holes on top of the ones that were in the Bible. But the truth is, the Bible didn't explain everything. And so there were things that needed to be clarified. And it, it said, next it says, these additions are known in the Talmud by the name of Shiniot, which means secondary. Did you hear Shini, Shin, uh, two, or second? But anyway, that was Shiniot is secondary. Uh, such as, listen to this, such as secondary, such as are given on the authority of the Sofrim, the scribes. The scribes' authority was considered secondary. So if somebody, it was said of someone that they spoke with authority, unlike the scribes. I'll let you ponder that one for a while. Oh, here's an example of one of those laws that are secondary. It says, now all proselytes are permitted to marry Israelites, and we do not suspect that they are descended of any of the nations forbidden in the Bible. Because remember, in the Bible, there were you couldn't marry people from Moab, which is exactly what uh, Naomi's family did. And Ruth came back from that very place and became very famous in Judaism, right? Because she was a Moabitess. She was from Moab. Just saying, when they convert like Ruth did, they become full Jews, and there's no reason why they can't be married. That wasn't in the law. The law said you couldn't marry him, but yet they did. And so anyway, the, the rabbis clarified that and wrote a law, a secondary law. Here's another interesting. A woman who was twice widowed, if both husbands died natural deaths, might not marry again. So there's a story, some of you probably have already thought of it. There's a story in the New Testament letters where there's like the woman is married to seven brothers. You know, they're, they're just, she just keeps being widowed and widowed and widowed. And they say, who is she supposed to marry? They were trying to trip him up with this very law. Didn't work out so well for him, though. He was aware of that law, I'm just saying. All right. Now, we're going to jump back and kind of go over some things that we've already gone over because, like I said, this was in no particular order. It says here, in rabbinic times, there were two distinct stages in the marriage ceremony. It's initiation, or the betrothal, which is called erusin, <laughs> and it's completion, or the marriage proper, nisuin. Uh, which, if you think about it, when you enter into covenant, marriage covenant, they're saying the word that means it, it is finished, it is completed. You know, um, it doesn't mean that it's over. It means that the ceremony is completed. Now it's time to live it out. Just thought I'd throw that out there for some of you. Uh, goes on. The betrothal was affected in any of the three following ways. By the man handing a coin that had to be worth at least a patua. Remember that was like one tenth of a penny or one one hundredth of a penny. It wasn't worth much. I don't remember what it was, but it, it wasn't much. But he had to hand her a coin. The smallest this is here Palestinian coin was sufficient for the purpose or it's equivalent to, in other words, you either had to hand her a coin that was worth at least that much, which was virtually nothing, or something equivalent to that value. It could be anything, absolutely anything. Or it's equivalent to the woman in the presence of two competent witnesses and pronouncing the words, be thou consecrated to me. 
probably not what they really said since they're all Jews. But anyway, or any other phrase conveying the same idea. So in other words, there was no set phrase. By the and handing a contract, a shetar, to the woman and containing the same formula by actual seems like I must have jumped something here. Yeah, that doesn't even make any sense. I don't know what they're talking about. He goes, uh, the manner of betrothal first mentioned seems to have been the most common, but later was modified so that in Instead of money, the man gave his bride a ring, plain and made of gold, the value of which was constant and well known. And they give a whole lot of examples of how why they would say that. It's uh, Tosepta Kiddish in the Talmud. Um, I don't even know how to say that guy's name. Eben Ha'ezer is some buddy who wrote about it. I don't I don't know who he is. Anyway. The act of betrothal might be performed also by proxies appointed either by the bride or by the groom. What they're saying is the groom can go and he can make a deal with the parents and he can hand this girl a, a uh, coin. Later it became a ring and it in it initiated this thing, but it's also trying to get across the idea because I don't want to read the whole thing. It's just too hard to read. But he's also trying to get a hold of the get across the idea that the father of the son could also do that. He could be a what they say proxy for the son. He can go and make the deal and all that, and he can hand her the ring. It doesn't have to be the groom. And on no, you know, on top of that. The father of the groom could send a ser his own servant to go find a wife for his son. Abraham did that with one of his kids, right? Uh, so it shouldn't surprise us that these things happen. But that's uh, that's all he's really trying to say in all of this little bitty text here with all these uh, pointing to all these other things that can happen. I'm going to move over here. I've just got some random thoughts that I pulled. This I pulled out of the Soncino Talmud uh, myself. There was a note in here that said, after the betrothal, the bridegroom, the guy the guy who's called the bridegroom, he's called the Arus. Remember the word Arusa? The Arus was the bridegroom. He would send gifts to his bride in connection with which there was a second feast at the father-in-law's house. As long as she, speaking of the bride, is in her father's house, she is reserved in regard to her husband. But when she comes to her father-in-law's house, she is no more so reserved in regard to him. They're saying restricted is what they're saying. There is a restriction. While she is still living, in her father's house, because she's in the first phase of the marriage, she doesn't live with him, she lives with her own father, there is a restriction. There's a restriction of access. They cannot be with each other. But when he comes and gets her, he takes her to his father's home. And when that happens, the restriction is lifted. That's all it's saying. They also say that the sons of the bridal chamber, they're using this term, the sons of the bridal chamber, denoting more strictly the friends of the bridegroom who prepared for him the bridal chamber and attended on him at the wedding. Um, I brought that up for the sake of the Christians because that's a term that's used in the New Testament. Anyway, uh, Rabbi Abubu, <laughs> that's not his name, uh, Bahu is his real name, but I like to call him Abubu, he said, when so, when do we begin to recite the benediction over rain? Now listen to this. When the bridegroom goes forth to meet the bride. 
Now, in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19, it basically says those who don't go to, you know, once the Mashiach comes, those who don't go to celebrate the Sukkot, the celebration of Sukkot, will not receive rain. So the blessing of the rain is said when the bridegroom comes for the bride. Y'all put that together in your minds. The terms of the marriage contract agreed to by the parents, the bride, and the bridegroom. They all three had to be in agreement or there was no contract. Gamera says, how much do you give to your son? Oh, it's this is the, uh, they're trying to give you an actual example of the, a generalized example of the actual uh, negotiation. How much do you give to your son? And it says, so much and so much. How much do you give to your daughter? So much and so much. If they then stood up and pronounced the dedication, the spousal formula, by this you become my bride, uh, they have acquired their legal right. She becomes his acquired possession. That's what they're trying to say. They don't say it in those words, but that's what they're getting at. Grooms may betroth, but not bring a bride home, and they may not make a feast of betrothal, nor effect a legal right marriage, as this is rejoicing for the groom. What they're talking about there is during Sukkot. The groom can initiate Erosim, but he cannot take his bride home, his betrothed home during Erosim. Uh, I'm sorry, during Sukkot, if they are still in Erosim. And he cannot enact a Leverite marriage during Sukkot because it's supposed to be a time of bliss and if she's a Leverite that means she's in mourning so they don't do that during Sukkot was an argument that was brought up to me by a, a scholar once when I said that the groom and the bride consummated they entered into the second phase of marriage over a, a hoopa, a white prayer shawl. He said he'd never seen that or read that anywhere. I actually found it in several places. Here's one of them. They were talking about that very thing. It said if this were so, because they're saying that, it, that there was that they didn't do this, and Rab, uh, Rabbah, the guy who was called Rabbah, the son of Ar Hanan, he said this to a guy named Abaye. Here's what he said If that were so, then why have a groomsman? Why have a sheet? That's what we're talking about the white prayer cloth, the sheet. Uh, and so Abaye said to him, there, the groomsman and the sheet are necessary. Perhaps he will see and destroy the tokens of her virginity. So that's why they're saying there has to be a sheet because if he decides to be dishonorable, he can say she's not a virgin. And that's why there has to be the friends of the bride because they're supposed to grab a hold of that and take it to the parents. There's a whole long argument on that. Uh, oh, I didn't write down where that was. I got that directly out of some Sino Talmud, though. And then there was talk about if the the uh, tali that was used is washed in a certain way. There's a long discussion about that, that it could wash away the tokens of virginity. So it makes it real clear what they are at that point. 
Anyway, so then we move on. It says the benediction has to be said all the seven days following the marriage. You're going to like the benediction uh, following the ceremony. And, and this implies rejoicing that the benediction has to be said all seven days in the case of the marriage of the young man. This is argued just endlessly about whether they say the benedictions, for instance, you have these benedictions that are that are spoken. They're spoken at the wedding. They're spoken after the wedding. They're spoken in some groups. They're spoken once a day for the whole seven days. In other groups, they only spoke them once and it was done. In other groups, they spoke all seven of them as the bride marched around the groom in the ceremony. There was a lot of different ways to do it. So I don't want to get, don't want to get hung up on that because that was a regional thing. But we do have the actual... Uh, words of these things that are said there in this wedding. There's the benediction of betrothal. This is the one for the bridegroom, I think. It says, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and has commanded us concerning the forbidden relations and has forbidden us uh, the betrothal and has unto us the betrothal and has allowed us the wedding through the marriage canopy and sanctification. In other words, you've made it a two-part thing. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies Yisrael through the canopy and sanctification. Now, here's the one that I believe that's supposed to be the groom saying it over the bride. It'd be the other way around. Anyway, I'm not really sure which, which way it goes because they weren't real clear. Anyway, here's the here's what is supposed to be said. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created all things to your glory, the creator of man, who has created man in your image, in the image and likeness of your form, who has prepared for yourself a building forever. That's the first one. Second one, blessed be you, O Lord, creator of mankind. May the barren greatly rejoice and exalt when her children will be gathered in her midst in joy. The third, blessed be you, O Lord, who makes Zion joyful through her children. May you make the loved companions greatly rejoice, even as in the past you gladden your creation in the Garden of Eden. Here's another one. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes bridegroom and bride to rejoice. The next one. Blessed are you, O Lord, our King, God of the universe, who has created joy and gladness, bridegroom and bride, rejoicing, song, mirth, and delight, love and betrothal, and peace and friendship. Here's another one. Speedily, O Lord, our God, and I, this may actually be a prayer. Speedily, O Lord, our God, may the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of the singing of bridegrooms from their canopies and of use from their feasts of songs be heard in the cities of Yehuda and in the streets of Jerusalem. Blessed are you, O Lord, this is another one, who makes the bridegroom to rejoice with the bride. And here's another way that they enter into these different phases. Another example. Behold, you are consecrated to me by this ring according to the law of Moshe and Yisrael. That's the more common one. Um, oh, check it out. The Jews are the ones that actually started Ash Wednesday. <laughs> Isaac said, this is symbolized by the burnt ashes which we place on where should they be placed? He replied, just where the phylactery is worn, as it says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them a garland for ashes, with whom mourners for Zion will be privileged to behold her joy, as it says, rejoice ye with Jerusalem. Ash Wednesday. Oh, by the way, that happens on Wednesday. <laughs> just say it. Uh, virgin brides were carried out of their father's home on the wedding day in a curtain 
litter. I'm not sure if that's litter or lighter. It's L-I-T-T-E-R. Merriam-Webster wrote, a covered and uh, contained couch provided with shafts and used for carrying a single passenger. You guys have seen those. Uh, started by, that was something the Jews did. A virgin bride walked to her wedding canopy with uncovered hair, which others render loosened hair. Loosened hair is uncovered hair. Uh, some of the things that are giving during, during the uh, Arusa are jewels, which the bridegroom sends to the bride. And this are after, before, during, and after betrothal. Here's a, this had to come from Mishnah. It says, deeds of betrothal and marriage are not to be written, because this is the actual written paper, deeds of betrothal and marriage are not to be written except with the consent of both parties. And the fee is paid by the bridegroom. And if that wasn't clear, for some reason they wrote in their notes, that the bridegroom is to pay the fee. <laughs> Arusa, betrothed, engaged, but not brought home. The betrothal carries with it almost all legal consequences of marriage. Here's something about the Arusa, a few things, I guess, about the Arusa. There were two stages of marriage, Erosine betrothal and Nisawin home-taking. The betrothal maiden was called Arusa and her husband, Arus. Erosine was as binding as marriage and could be annulled only by divorce, but cohabitation was forbidden and the Arusa remained in her father's house until the Nisawin. By maiden, Na'ara, a girl between 12 years and one day and 12 and a half years plus one day is meant, after which she becomes a vulgarit, which means she's not a minor, is all that is. Uh, check this out. There's another note under here that's talking about what she's supposed to do. It's to make, she's to make ne the necessary preparations for marriage, such as acquiring a trousseau, the reference is to an Arusa, a, and 12 months is the maximum that may elapse before the Nisawin without either side having legal cause for complaint. In other words, if you entered into Arusin, you had 12 months to complete the marriage. If you didn't complete it in 12 months, they had legal authority to annul, not divorce, but annul the marriage. The uh, word I couldn't pronounce, it's not a Hebrew word. Um, it's talking about bridesmaids, just saying. I think it's a French word, to tell you the truth. I don't know why it's in the Talmud. Once her father delivers her to one who becomes responsible for her food, raiment, and conjugal rights, he may no longer sell her. Because remember, they say sell, and it sounds awful. It sounds like someone's selling his daughter into slavery. No, the daughter could be an indentured servant for a very limited amount of time, and that's what, he, what's what they're talking about. Uh, but they're saying once she's married, the father can't do that anymore because he has no legal rights over his daughter at that point. And then they point out here uh, that for some reason that Ruth popped the question when she said, cover me with your skirt. I don't know why they say it that way. It's like everybody, all the Jews read the King James Bible for some reason. I don't know. Uh, marriage consists of two stages. And here they call it Kiddushin, which is Erosin, because uh, the Kiddushin is... The concentration is on the payment, it, where everything is just the word for betrothal, whereby the matrimonial bonds is made 
not to be broken without divorce, and hupa, or homecoming, without which cohabitation is forbidden. Yeah, so it's saying that the first stage, the woman is called the Arusa, and in the second stage, she's called Nesua. And then they give a real clear uh, explanation of what the Arusa is. It says, it's what you call a woman who is still under her parents' roof. And then it says, until her entry into the bridal chamber, the hoopah, a daughter is still partially under the control of her father, who is still entitled to her handiwork and remains her heir. So any money that she's making and all that, the father actually has control over. Hear that, Jessica? Be, you need to start giving me a paycheck. <laughs> Just say it, says it right here. <laughs> Just woke her up. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> Here's something from the Mishnah. It's uh, Ketavot 2a. It's Mishnah chapter 1. A maiden is married on the fourth day of the week and a widow on the fifth day. For twice in the week, the courts of justice sit in the towns on the second day of the week and on the fifth day so that if he, speaking of the husband, had a claim as to the virginity of the maiden bride. He could go early on the morning of the fifth day of the week to the court of justice. Again, this is dark ages. There was something else that I found in Ketubah 3b. The sages watch over the interests of the daughters of Israel so that the man should prepare for the wedding feast for three days. I'm going to close with this, so listen to me carefully. The sages watched over the interests of the daughters of Israel, so that the man should prepare for the wedding feast three days. Three days. She won't see him. He'll be gone for three days. The first day in the week, and the second day in the week, and the third day in the week. There is no coincidence as to the days that Yeshua disappeared after he said it is finished. It was these very days. And from the time of danger, which I believe is the destruction of the temple, I think that's what they mean by that. No one knows. I mean, they argued about it. Nobody nobody knew for sure. And onwards, <coughs> from that time on, the people made it a custom to marry on the third day, and the sages did not interfere with them. And on the second day of the week, he shall not marry. And if on account of the constraint... Uh, it is allowed. And one separates the bridegroom from the bride on the nights of Sabbath at the beginning. Uh, so from the very beginning, there's certain things that are not supposed to happen on the Sabbath, I'm just saying. But anyway, I wanted to end it with that because everything in the New Testament that I've read and translated Everything leads right up to there is no difference in the way they talk and the way they did things than what you find the Jews following. Because it's a Jewish document. All right. That's the best I got for you today. I will see you guys Tuesday night, right? Is that it, Tony? Yeah. Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. So if you're on the East Coast, it's a 